Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Listen, I'm cynical enough that when our National Day for Truth and Reconciliation comes around, I don't expect a check-in on Canada's progress to blow me away. I would hope that we've completed a few of the 94 calls to action offered by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that we're making real progress on others. That we're doing better, really, year by year, pushing forward for a more equitable Canada. And in past years, there was a report put forward by an institute that tracks how well our government is tackling this that offered us a detailed overview. You'll notice that I said past years. There isn't one this year. And the reason why opens up a lot of questions, mostly about our government's commitment to truth and reconciliation, but also about our commitment as Canadians to go beyond listening and learning for a few days in late September. And questions about what this day might become if we're not careful here. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Dr. Eva Jewell is the research director at Yellowhead Institute, an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University, and she is Anishinaabe from Deshken Zibing, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. Hello, Eva. Hi, thank you for having me. For the past a number of years, Yellowhead Institute has done a report uh, that highlights which of the calls to action the government has managed to address each year. And I ask you this uh, because in the 2021 report, three calls to action were completed that year, then two calls to action in 2022, and zero in your 2023 report. What happened that year? Yeah, so it was a very disappointing report, to say the least, um, coming off of the, I guess, anticipation of all of the calls to action that were completed in the prior years um, before 2023. To see that none were completed was a big letdown. But we suspect what was happening was there was more effort being put into the National Council for Reconciliation. But that still doesn't explain the lack of movement in a lot of key areas, like the legacy calls to action, things like publishing annual reports that are key to understanding the discriminatory practices that exist in funding and in closing measurable health outcomes and overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the justice system and so on. So we suspect that there was a lot of effort being put into this national council as kind of the magic uh, impetus of reconciliation, which we have many reasons to worry for that as well. And we can talk about that for sure. But first, I want to ask you about when or if uh, we will see a report this year. So this was the second year in our five years of authoring the report that we were reporting on no calls to action completed. And it was feeling very futile. It was feeling very embittering and angering to be writing reports on nothing, analyzing nothing year after year, right? And so particularly when three calls to action were magically completed in, in three weeks alone in 2021. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, we decided to pause the project. Um, we we are not really interested in, you know, kind of becoming embittered cynics, <laughs> or at least I'm not. I should speak for myself. I'm interested more in investing my energy and resources in topics that are of importance to my community. And I can't, we can't, you know, as Indigenous people hold our breath for reconciliation. So at the end of the day, I want to put my effort and my energy into projects that are um, and into research direction at Yellowhead Institute that support Indigenous jurisdiction and reclamation and restoration. Do you think, and I realize that this is a kind of a delicate thing to ask, that when people dip in and check in on the calls to action that 
they can sometimes focus on them uh, in terms of ticking boxes uh, as a yes or no answer and not on uh, the work that, you know, is or isn't being done, but might not result in an immediate check mark. Yeah. And I think that's the issue with reconciliation. It's the issue with the exercise of, you know, creating calls to action. I mean, certainly the TRC didn't expect for them to become like a checklist. It was meant to be guides to transforming a Canadian society that has more equity built in it for uh, for Indigenous peoples to, you know, live in our own homelands with a quality of life that we define for ourselves, right? That means having our languages, our cultures, our worldviews intact, you know? And those were all destroyed or at least um, it's threatened, gravely threatened under this, the residential school system. And it continues, uh, those continue to be threatened under enduring Canadian systems like child welfare, like the education system that underfunds our children. And not even just to say underfunds our children in areas of, you know, a typical Canadian curriculum, let alone our own worldviews that we need to pass on and preserve. You know, so there's a lot of different ways that Canada systemically continues to degrade Indigenous life. And that isn't widely understood on the part of Canadians because you don't live it. You don't need to, you know, understand it really. Reconciliation then is a really complex relationship making that I don't I don't know if we have the or the right understanding or the right conditions for that to actually take place, particularly when the harm is still ongoing. When you look at what the government is doing or is touting and claiming to do, whether that's National Council or or other uh, measures, do you see the same kind of urgency and momentum that at least uh, ostensibly was created uh, about five years ago? I don't think so. I think that we are, um, you know, reconciliation risks being just more harm reductions, particularly when we're starting to see this rhetorical shift toward economic reconciliation. This is a worrying trend that I see happening with the popularization of, uh, I have reconciliation was always popular, but with it being um, more, you know, ingrained in Canadian society through the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So now we've got the corporate sector or right-leaning politicians calling for economic reconciliation, which is to say, creating conditions for Indigenous peoples to be more aligned with a capitalist system. And that to me is worrying. That's not reconciliation. Reconciliation is about changing the system so that they don't produce further harm. It's about recognizing Indigenous laws. You know, like we are here in the Toronto area and that's the Dish With One Spoon Treaty territory. That's a law. That's a law that means don't take more than you need from the land. It requires a fundamental shift to how Canadians live their daily lives. And that is not the reconciliation we're hearing about. We're hearing about these ways that we can kind of jam Indigenous peoples to fit better in the system that we don't want to, you know, that Canada doesn't want to change. This is not to necessarily equate the two populations and uh, the difficulties they've both faced. But when you said that about economic reconciliation, I was struck by conversations that we've also had around pride, which also started as a radical protest against uh, oppression and ended up with logos splashed across corporate banners. Do you know what I mean? 100%. Like Marsha P. Johnson was throwing a brick at Stonewall. Yeah. You know, she wasn't like... (laughs) I want to see my colors on your bank. <laughs> you know, like that wasn't her end. Her end goal was like liberation. How do we reframe the conversation that's happened now? And I say this recognizing and maybe even apologizing for the fact that we are going to air this conversation on the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which can sometimes make it feel, I don't know, tributary and corporate. I've always been of the mind that being involved in the conversation of reconciliation is really important, even if we're highly critical of it, because that's the way that the Canadian public is framing the discussion around their relationship with Indigenous people. So it's like we kind of have to be here talking about it on these days, like National Day for Truth and Reconciliation or other days like Solidarity Day or Indigenous Peoples Day and so on. 
these are the times when the Canadian public has shifted their focus to this topic. And you're right, it does become tributary. And so in that way, I wonder about its sustainability as a as an actual method of transformation, as an actual method of restoration of Indigenous jurisdiction or Indigenous liberation, you know, and Indigenous nationhood and so on. It's definitely got its limits. However, I think there was a bit of wisdom in the in the calls to action in another way, because the commissioners ensured that at least once a year we are talking about it. And before 2021, nobody was really talking about it to this extent. And that's what was so frustrating about writing the reports every year before 2021, was we would release the reports on the anniversary of the TRC's final report on December 15th to like little, you know, attention. It would just be like, oh yeah, okay, calls to action, what are those, you know? And we would be like, you know, frustrated, like, hey, you said you would implement all of these. So following 2021 and the revelations at Kamloops and Maryville and other residential schools and that implementation, there's at least a conversation about it that's public. And I think that's that's we got to say that that's something, even if it's not, you know, the be all end all. It's not the solution. It's a doorway. It's a step to it. Well, I will say, you know, as um, tributary and corporate as it might feel at sort of a higher level, the one thing that I have really noticed is I have a daughter in grade two and she is learning stuff about uh, Indigenous people and their relationship and their treatment in Canada that I never, ever learned in school, like at all. Yeah, I think that is another bright aspect of this, right, is that we are having this conversation for the generations that are coming after us. And this comes to something that I've been increasingly more interested in, and that is like this idea of social reproduction. Like, how are we reproducing citizens of of the state? Like, what are we, what values are we accepting as being important in this, in this arrangement of reconciliation, right? And of course, we know it's truth and reconciliation. So if the next generation is at least coming up with the truth, you know, maybe it's a little ways off. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not too sure, but it's possible. <laughs> well, in that, in that spirit, then I will ask you uh, from the 2023 report, you know, while noting that no boxes had been checked, you identified some specific calls that uh, even though they would likely not be completed would represent really meaningful progress. Could you maybe walk us through uh, some of those and, and what they focus on? Well, all of the legacy calls to action are those that call for substantive change in the lives of Indigenous peoples. So we have to remember that in reconciliation, there's a few different implications there. Reconciliation is about reforming um, systems that still cause harm. And those first 42 calls to action call for those changes. And those are the calls to action that we've seen the least progress. So all of those areas, you know, child welfare, health, education, justice, those are all systems that are still producing inequities and discriminatory experiences that that Indigenous peoples are enduring, that they're surviving still, right? So when we talk about these types of changes that's really important, we're talking about funding practices that give equity to First Nations schools. Okay, so I grew up on a First Nation. I grew up going to a school that received far less funding than the school, you know, 20 minutes off the res, right? So those schools on reserve are dealing with with fewer resources. In areas of health, you know, we are dealing with these massive gaps in uh, health outcomes due to a lack of food security, due to uh, clean drinking water, due to proper housing, sanitation, all of these basic parts of human life that Canadians take for granted, Indigenous peoples aren't, we don't enjoy that same privilege. And that's just in education and health. There's many more in, in child welfare and justice. The two are very closely connected because children who are in care tend to be involved in the Uh, justice system afterwards. 
And so these are all, again, symptoms of underfunding, of discrimination, of ongoing internal intergenerational trauma. Now, I could sit here and tell you all the different ways that Indigenous peoples are experiencing, you know, a lower quality of life, but that really doesn't tell you much about who we are as Indigenous peoples. That tells you what the system is doing to us. So what's really, you know, who we are as Indigenous peoples is our our ways of life, our perspectives, our philosophies, our culture, our language, all of which we are amidst the many different ways that our physical life and well-being are threatened, we are still fighting to preserve all of that as well. And so these are all, you know, purposeful outcomes of a system of colonialism. That's what we mean when we're saying the system is still hurting us, it's still harming us. It didn't, you know, it didn't end that the Canadian government closed those residential school doors and everybody went home and it was okay, right? On that note, a week ago, leading up to National Truth and Reconciliation Day, uh, the Canadian Medical Association issued a formal apology. And I wonder what your thoughts are on those kind of apologies from uh, organizations in general and what kind of impact they have on the very real experiential problems uh, that you just described? I think that it's possible they will bring an awareness if the, you know, health staff or healthcare sector is made abundantly aware of its role in continuing the harm, right? And, you know, when we talk about big systems, we tend to depersonalize it. That these are actual people causing harm in these systems. It's a nurse. It's a nurse causing you harm. It's a doctor not believing you. Right. It's not a letterhead. (laughs) Exactly. It's not just like a group of, you know, this big, scary, faceless system. These are actual Canadians populating these systems that perpetuate the discrimination. And so as long as these uh, organizations are producing these apologies and will they commit to the change that the calls action call for, which is to educate its sector, its professional organization on their role in perpetuating colonial behaviors. Things like paternalism or having just an inherent uh, discrimination whereby, you know, certain care is provided to Indigenous individuals versus, you know, a non-Indigenous individual, which we saw in the case of Joyce Eshaquan, right? And so I think that, you know, it's a gesture, it's, but it's not the end. We'll get to the government in a second. But first, after years of uh, learning and listening, I guess, uh, what can the Canadian public actually do to create some momentum on the priorities that you just mentioned? It's a tough question because some of the most material and tangible change that can happen happens in those structures. So it happens in policy, right? And so what that would require of a Canadian public is to become active within like a community political setting. You know, it's possible that by organizing and assembling to pressure a political representative, if that were done, you know, throughout Canada to pressure political representatives to follow through on certain calls to action, like repudiating the doctrine of discovery which the doctrine of discovery forms the basis legal argument that Canada makes over First Nations and Indigenous lands and justifies resource extraction in our territories, right? So we're talking about a public that paying attention, a public that isn't apathetic to what its country is doing, right? And that to me is particularly when we're in an age where there's so many demands on our attention, feels like a really monumental, you know, demand of a public that, you know, benefits from that structure. But if we see the connections between something like the Canadian state and say what's happening in Palestine, right, you start to see that it's kind of interconnected throughout the whole world. And these systems rely upon one another. And it's at some point, you know, it's going to be impacting somebody else in the globe, but it's happening here too. So, It's like about gathering uh, all of that energy and putting forth what you can to a cause that you think has the most impact, right? And that, I don't know, it's, it's a big question. Yeah, 
And when you talk about using that power politically, and you look at the fact that uh, we're currently, whether it's next month or next year, very close to a new federal election in Canada, obviously, we don't need to go over the fact that uh, the government is not very popular right now. This is a liberal government that, actual results aside, has talked a very impressive game on truth and reconciliation and, you know, to your point, made some progress, especially in the early years. Uh, What do you think of what this government still might do on this issue and what uh, your thoughts are on likely a conservative government uh, replacing them at some point in the future? There's always a pendulum swing, right? In, In settler politics, they swing left, they swing right. Right. And we've endured under all of them. Usually under the right governments or under the conservative governments, we get pushed into these, you know, uh, systems of austerity. More harms will occur, more more budget cuts. All of these things, you know, things that we're not really, uh, that we're not stranger to. Uh, I think under a conservative government, we will definitely see a shift toward economic reconciliation. That will be the sole, like that will be the main way that reconciliation will be framed. The calls to action will likely be, you know, the, their importance, particularly in the in the government, might be abandoned. I'm not sure how the National Council for Reconciliation would fare under a conservative government. They might see a very minimal budget. They are endowed, so they have at least a bit of money for a a while. It would definitely swing more toward economic, capitalistic endeavors. An ongoing liberal government would probably continue down the path that they're going, the National Council for Reconciliation, and it would still continue the uh, gestures, I think, of reconciliation. And we would then still be talking to you in a couple years' time about... Uh, how many First Nations still have boil water advisories, for example? You know, I think it's just under both. Like this is the system of Canada. It doesn't have a party. This is this is the system that we experience. It. That's the thing. It's like reconciliation isn't a partisan issue. It's a it's a colonial issue. It's a settler colonial issue, and that's Canada is a settler colonial state, and it's just going to be like that until Canada decides that you know it's actually going to recognize Indigenous jurisdiction and hand over the resources that are owed to us. Well, to end that on a hopeful note, maybe that is, you know, to your point earlier, the generation that comes up learning about the truth from the start, as opposed to having to confront their own false ideas later in life. True. Yeah. Eva, thank you so much for this. Always appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Dr. Eva Jewell, Research Director at Yellowhead Institute. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can plug in Eva's name in the search function and find her past appearances on this show. And if you have any feedback for us, please hit us up at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by leaving a voicemail when you call 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every podcast player and on your favorite smart speaker if you ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.